Welcome to our third episode of Women Tech Makers Give Back with Code Academy's Sasha Landi. My name is Angela Lin, and I work on the YouTube education team. I work with partners like TED, Khan Academy, and edX to ensure that anybody can learn anything through YouTube. Um, prior to Google, I worked um, in entertainment, started my career off at NBC. If any of you have watched 30 Rock, um, you can think about Kenneth Page. I was a page at NBC. Um, outside of Google's not just about work, 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 um, I also uh, love to dance and try out all the good eats around San Francisco. And with that, I will hand it to my co-host, Bridget Sexton. Thank you. I'm Bridget Sexton. I'm on the Google for Entrepreneurs team. Uh, my team focuses on how Google can foster entrepreneurship around the world. We do this through a number of things, partnerships with groups like Startup Weekend, our own programs where we do educational outreach um, and actually help try to figure out where entrepreneurs can fill some white spaces and do awesome things on the web and mobile. And we also look at uh, our products, how our products can actually help entrepreneurs grow their business. Um, before this, I actually worked on the Google Africa team for two years, based out of Ghana and some out of Kenya as well and have been at Google for a five. Before that, I just enjoyed a lot of traveling. And um, I also do some things out of work, running mainly, <laughs> running to work, <laughs> biking to work, um, and a lot of cooking. But have been fortunate to just be surrounded by awesome people here and, and impressive women. Um, today, we're actually joined by one of those impressive women, Sasha, Sasha Laundry, who was one of the fourth employees. She was a fourth employee at Code Academy. And uh, Sasha, would you mind introducing yourself? Sure. Uh, I'm really excited to be here today. This is a really cool series that you guys are doing, and I'm really honored to be invited. Um, I currently work at Code Academy in New York, and I'm the. I was a fourth employee there. We've doubled in size since I started back in February, and uh, before that, I lived in San Francisco and enjoyed all the good eats around San Francisco. <laughs> and I worked at Twilio, which is a telephony API base in downtown San Francisco. Before that, I was a developer intern at this like really tiny gaming startup, uh, pre-funding, very different experience than Twilio. Before that, I was a high school teacher. I taught physics and neuroscience at high schools in Connecticut and San Francisco. Um, and so I did a big switch into tech while I was here. It sort of is in the water in San Francisco, I think. Um, and I'd be happy to talk about all that today. So looking forward to chatting. Great. Well, you have a fascinating background, and we will get into it. But first of all, why don't you tell us a little bit about Code Academy? Um, what types of code coding lessons do you use? I spent some time on the site. Actually, admittedly, got a little bit hooked myself <laughs> <laughs> with one of the courses. I think that's one of the things you mean to do. Yep. Um, so tell us a little bit about your target market and what you guys are up to. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, um, if you've taken a look at our website, now might be a good time to do that. Uh, we offer interactive programming lessons in HTML, CSS, JavaScript, Python, and Ruby. Um, and our aim is to get people hooked on programming. I think it's really important that programming is seen as something that's interesting and can solve real problems for people. Because otherwise, young people won't get interested in it. And we've got a big shortage in developers right now. Um, so with our interactive lessons, uh, you're able to get, we don't make you do any installation or downloads or configuration, which can take a really long time and really isn't very fun. Um, the fun part is the coding. So we let you get started on that right away. So there's a, a console on our the front page of our website that asks you to type in your name, and you start using strings right away. So you just get going coding. Um, and we make sure that the, the lessons on our site are interactive so you can actually learn by doing, learn by coding, in the same way that um, instead of having to pick up a book and read hundreds of pages, you can sort of just get started right away. Uh, we also make sure that the projects we have people doing are uh, really practical. So instead of doing some an, an esoteric math problem, and don't get me wrong, I love math problems. Um, definitely love math. But uh, not everyone does. And so we make sure that the projects that people do are really practical. And so they feel like they could pick this up and use it in whatever job they have uh, to become more effective and, and maybe you know do things faster or more powerfully than they could before. That's awesome. Thanks. How many users do you guys have currently? Uh, we have millions of users. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. And what is how has the uh, the teaching of code evolved over time from 10 years ago, 20 years ago to yeah. what you guys are teaching today and how are you seeing that sort of um, encouraging more? Developers? That's a great question. Um, we've got I think, you know, I, I wasn't learning programming 20 years ago, but uh, we have this rise of interpreted languages that are um, abstract away some of the really difficult parts about programming, like mem memory management and things like that. Um, and so there are languages like Python, which are great to learn programming with, because they get rid of a lot of the syntax that can really trip up beginners um, and help them really focus on the, the concepts. 
Um, we're also able to put these lessons online, which we weren't able to do before. But now we've got this like pretty massive web application that lets you emulate all these programming languages in the browser. And uh, so people can, we can host these sorts of lessons online in a way that we couldn't do 10 or 20 years ago. So um, we're really, the advances in technology and the internet are making it a lot easier to teach people in new ways. So instead of the book and then computer combination, we've sort of merged the two. So the instruction and the actual practice and learning happen in the same console. So it seems like you have a really innovative course creator where, like you're saying, mm -hmm. anybody can actually yeah. teach a course and put a course together. Um, tell us a little bit more about that. And yeah. if, you, if you have a favorite course that you've created <laughs> that we should be taking. Sure. Uh, we've got, a, 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 as you say, we've got a course creator tool. So anyone out there who's interested in teaching the world how to code can pick it up and create a lesson that looks just like the ones that we have on our site. Um, and we've got this system to help you. We've got feedback at every step of the way. And we've got a few thousand beta testers who are like champing at the bit to get uh, access to the newest courses and test out those courses and get the bugs out before they launch to the mainstream. So um, we help you basically learn this new format. And, and people who are, there are some really talented people who are great at programming, great at explaining. And uh, this lets them reach a huge audience. Because we've got users in more than 100 countries and a huge range of people taking our lessons. So um, I'd love to see what you come up with there. <laughs> I saw that you guys are offering kits for after school classes now. Yeah. How is that going? Uh, it's going really well. We've, um, and let me tell you a little bit about why we did that. Because I think it's important to understand that. Uh, particularly for the sorts of people who are watching this, it's important to understand what's happening with the kids, uh, especially in the US right now. Um, we've actually seen a decline in the number of computer science courses, both AP level and intro level, that are offered in the US. Uh, and teachers are less and less prepared to teach those classes, which is a problem because the internet's not going away anytime soon, right? Technology is here to stay. We hope not. We hope right. the internet is not <laughs> going away anytime soon. <laughs> it's okay. um, and Google's in, you know, doing a great job in helping it become here to stay and keeping it useful and huge and interesting. Um, so technology is not going away. And it's becoming increasingly important that people understand how technology works when they use it, that they're not just consuming the technology, but they have some understanding of how it was made. Um, and this is impacting field after field after field. You've seen what's happened to the music industry mm -hmm. in the last few years. Um, that's going to happen. To, it's going to revolutionize pretty much every industry that we have. And so to become relevant and valuable in this modern society, you have to understand technology um, and really uh, understand how things are put together because if you don't it's very easy for people who are, have that power and have that understanding to uh, you know take advantage of you and, and and get ahead in a way that you can so school Estonia have you heard of this Estonia news it's it's pretty interesting Estonia recently um, announced that they're gonna teach every first grader how to program every first grader wow. is gonna know how to program computers um, which is really interesting. So Estonia is figuring this out, and they're like, okay, we have to get ahead of this trend. We have a uh, trend. We have to prepare our students for this sort of modern world, this brave new world, um, and they're taking the appropriate steps. But the U.S. is actually cutting computer science classes. So uh, we've talked to a lot of passionate teachers who understand that this is a problem, and they know they need to prepare their students. Uh, and so we basically, instead of having them wait a year to get trained and maybe wait another year for their school district to add in the computer science classes. What we've done is we made sort of a computer science kit club in a box. So they can pick this up. They have all the lessons, all the curriculum. We even made like photocopyable posters with cute robots on them. So they can just like <laughs> photocopy them and put them around their school announcing their club. Um, some stickers, because everyone loves stickers. And we've made this free for anyone who signed up. And we, we put it up on the web. We didn't really know how many people would be interested. We made 250 kits and hope for the best. And we had more than, uh, I think we had 2,000 schools sign up in the first month and a half, which wow. blew us away. Um, so there's clearly a ton of demand for this. And this isn't just in the US, it's all over the world as well. But um, with these kits, teachers can pick this up, get started today, even if they don't know how to program, which is crucial. Mm -hmm. um, because since the students get feedback on our website, they don't need to know how to program because they don't need to, to you know, be grading kids' homework or anything like that. Um, all of the, the backup support they need is in the forums or in the tool itself. And uh, it's, it's just a really useful tool. So we've been hearing lots of stories and getting cute pictures from teachers who are using this to teach lots of kids how to program. A lot of really adorable games have been emailed into us, um, even a few programming jokes, which always makes our day. <laughs> um, and so we can't wait to see what people do with it in the spring semester.
Are you, you thinking about doing some sort of hackathon for to encourage <laughs> these students to compete maybe internationally? That's a great idea. We haven't set that up yet, but um, we've been supporting a few people who are who are interested in putting together hackathons that are more focused on beginners. So um, as they see, they're starting to see hackathons instead of a competition where you go when you already have skills mm -hmm. as a way of acquiring those skills and uh, meeting new people and, and learning new things. And so it's interesting seeing how how the definition of a hackathon is being broadened. And we're able to support people in that because we have these lessons that people can use and um, and teach their you know folks new to hackathons how to program. That's so. really neat. Thanks. How have you seen the kids who go through this program and also other people on your course where use that and apply it in their own lives and create technologies? That's a great question. Um, we've seen a few different things. We've seen people who actually make the switch from some other career to programmer. Um, so they become professional developers, which is really cool. Um, they start with us and generally add on more information because right now our curriculum is really focused on beginners. Um, and we've also seen people pick this up and add skills to their own skill set in their own field without becoming professional developers. There have been a few groups that are particularly interested in this. Librarians um, are very much on ahead of the curve there. Uh, journalists and scientists are also some other groups that we've seen form their own study groups and apply their learning to their own fields. Um, and there are also two individuals, two stories I can tell you. One is uh, this guy who took our JavaScript lessons and managed to put together an app uh, that's a workout app. It picks a random workout for you. Uh, he based it on our dice game lesson, which is early in our JavaScript track. And he put it on the App Store and got 100,000 downloads in the first few weeks it was up, which is pretty cool. Um, so technology lets you reach more people than you ever could before. It lets you reach people who aren't near you, aren't in your field. Um, and so that's another reason why it's so important to understand technology and be able to create it, not just consume it. Um, and one other story, which is this woman named Martha, who is an 18-year-old in Kenya. Um, and she got an internship and managed to get a hold of a laptop and the internet and um, for the first time. And she found our lessons and got hooked on the Ruby lessons. So she quit her internship, saved up enough to buy a little laptop, and is now working as a Ruby on Rails like apprentice developer in, uh, in Kenya. And so she's been helping us out with actually some of our code on the side, which is pretty cool. So we hope to hear many more stories like that. And if you've got one, please share it with us. We'd love to hear it. So right now, I'm just curious. Um, the lessons are very interactive, and it's basically text, mm -hmm. more, more focused on text. Yep. Are you guys, and I have to ask the YouTube <laughs> question, because I'm asking from YouTube point of view. Um, sure. Are you guys thinking about incorporating video at any point into the product? We would love to. I think there's a role for video. I think just watching videos, I think, is you know a step in the right direction. But combining it with video plus being able to interact mm -hmm. with the material uh, could be really cool. So let's talk about that afterwards. OK. Yeah. <laughs> And also, besides uh, uh, having courses on the web technologies, mm -hmm. which is awesome, uh, do you have any plans of moving more towards having some mobile programming classes, like potentially Android? Yeah, Android. <laughs> we would love to. And to do Android, we need Java, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, we would love to. The tricky part about putting Java in the web is that it's compiled language, right? So that adds some, uh, some technical hurdles for us in terms of implementing it. But we, we would love to. So. Yeah. We had an emulator at one point, and we still do. So okay. maybe that's a potential way to okay. incorporate it. Okay, let's talk about this. Yeah. <laughs> we have, it's certainly very requested. Lots of people write in asking for Java and asking for Android. Awesome. Yeah. So Sasha, tell us, you gave us a brief bio in the beginning. You sound like you have a really interesting background. Tell us a little bit more about what got you into tech. Um, maybe even when you were a teacher, are there ways, are there things that Code Academy is enabling things that Code Academy is enabling now that you feel like, oh, if only I had this tool when I was teaching? That's a great question. Uh, yeah, and I think my story is a, is a good example of like why I'm so passionate about what Code Academy is doing and why I made the leap to move to New York and work for this company um, when it was so tiny. And I actually, someone I still to this day don't know who added programming to my, my sophomore year of high school. Uh, course schedule. And I was like, okay, why not? Like, I, I don't know what the C++ is, but I took this class. It was in C++, and I really enjoyed writing programs. I got really into it. It was like solving a puzzle. Um, but the, the projects we did were so boring. It was like formatting a receipt from your restaurant bill that I was just like, why would I do this when I could do physics, you know? And so I went off and I studied physics and I ended up majoring in physics at Swarthmore College. And uh, that was great. But as I got to know people who were in the computer science program there, there's a great computer science program there, um, I got to see that they were doing really interesting work and solving really interesting problems. I took a computer vision class where we had to like try to identify faces just based on the pixels and, and write an algorithm that found your eyes. That's one project we did. Um, and 
it was only at that point that I figured out how cool programming was. And so I really wish that I'd had a much more engaging experience that got me hooked much younger mm -hmm. because I would be much farther along in terms of my own programming skills than I am now if I'd gotten started earlier. So I'm really excited to get lots of, you know, the new generation of kids hooked on programming really young. And so, yeah, that's why I think it's so important to make it fun at first. It doesn't have to be fun the whole time, <laughs> right? There are frustrating bits of it. Yeah. But it's really important that people's first impression with programming is, is practical, interesting, and mm -hmm. engaging. You probably never thought you'd be where you are right now today. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty awesome transition from being a teacher into, into what you're doing now. I think we love scale at Google, so the mm -hmm. idea of scaling education, yeah. especially YouTube, is huge into that. And I think it, we look at great content as being a key. Mm -hmm. um, so what do you, how do you guys keep your content fresh? How do you sort of know what to teach next? Or are you really focused on the basics? That's a great question. Um, and we're doing a combination of refreshing and focusing on the basics. Uh, when you get started, you have to understand a certain number of building blocks conceptually in programming to be able to build anything. Mm -hmm. uh, for loops, you know, if else statements, variables are a really tricky concept for beginners. So we need people to learn some of the basics before they can do interesting stuff. So right now we're focusing on that, but we're gradually expanding it as well. So there are more and more, pro we launched projects this past week so you can pick up what you've learned and build something cool with it. Um, and, uh, sorry, tell me the second part of your question again. Just staying fresh, like staying up to date. It's yeah, such a challenge. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we do a lot of testing um, to make sure that our lessons are working for people. So we have a lot of metrics, we gather a lot of feedback, and we make sure to refresh the courses so that they're uh, as high quality as possible and so that people stick around and learn as long as possible. So we're doing a combination of adding to our curriculum and refreshing what we already have as well. When a new course is created, mm -hmm. is the vetting done by the beta testers that you were talking about, or is there someone on the team that actually goes through yeah. first? And a combination. So when you pick up the course creator tool and you create a course, uh, we offer feedback at a few stages. Uh, someone from Codecademy currently looks at your course and gives you feedback on it for the first stage. And then once it's moved over to beta testers, we've got lots and lots of pe thousands of beta testers who have signed up to test the latest courses and get some feedback on it. Um, and so they do a great job of finding any of those like rough spots, mm -hmm. things that might not be super clearly explained or any bugs in the submission correctness test. And they find those and expose those before the course goes out to everyone else, which is super helpful. Well, we actually have a question okay. on our Dory here uh, for what is the best uh, web languages to learn? This is from New Jersey. Okay. Um, I think I might know who that is. <laughs> I might be one of our beta testers. Um, what is the best language? Yes. Yeah. What, are the best, what are the best languages to learn? So this guy oh. seems like he's just getting started with Dawn. Um, where should he start? That's a great question. Um, and I think that's one place, I know when I was starting, I got totally overwhelmed by the number of things. I was like, I have to learn HTML and CSS, and Python, and Django, and Ruby, and Rails, and like, oh, why not throw in some C? Because that'll teach you memory management and fundamentals, you know, all the stuff I missed because I wasn't a computer science major. Um, and I think it's really easy to get overwhelmed. Um, but picking one thing that's a good fit for what you want to do and just learning that and like get into it, have a good time, it doesn't particularly matter what you pick up as long as you pick it up and stay with it until you learn the fundamentals. Um, and when in doubt, I, I'm, a, I'm a Python girl. So <laughs> Python's a great all-purpose programming language. It's pretty easy to pick up. It teaches you the same concepts that you'll need for other languages. So and, and when Google in doubt, loves Python. Python. Oh. We love Python. Python. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I guess related to that f uh, first question, we also have one around the best sequencing. So mm -hmm. you were talking about which ones in Python, but yeah. is there, um, you know, there's definitely tracks that you can go down. Is sure. there a recommended sequence of tracks? Sure. Uh, you're referring to the tracks on our site? or mm -hmm. tracks? Yeah. Um, so if you take a look at our site, we've got tracks that guide you through. And that's another thing we do, because we found that beginners get super overwhelmed, mm -hmm. and they don't know where to start. And so we've created these tracks that make a really linear path just to get them started. And we find that once people go through those tracks, they can then understand the choices they're making much better and can make better choices and uh, feel less overwhelmed by the choices that they have. Um, but in terms of going through the tracks, if you're a complete beginner and you're a little scared, that's fine. You're not alone. Trust me, we get emails from those people all the time. Uh, but I recommend starting with what we call the web track, which is HTML and CSS. You'll make a first web page. It's not technically programming. Lots of people would say, hey, that's not programming. But 
It does get you familiar with the tool. It gets you understanding that the thing you write and the final product are two different things. Um, and you can make a cool web page. And then you can learn JavaScript, which lets you make that web page interactive and do cool stuff. Writing that down. <laughs> <laughs> so web track first. If you're, if you're you know, nervous, if you've done some programming, or already made websites before, I'd recommend starting with Python, Ruby, or JavaScript. Um, oh, and we have a new jQuery track, which is really cool, because uh, jQuery is a library of JavaScript. So there's all this pre-written code all over the internet that you can use. Um, so you don't have to write as much, but you can do really impressive stuff, with, like fade in, fade out, like sliding accordion web pages mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So um, that's actually a pretty fun and flashy way to get started if you want to impress your friends. So, What are some of the favorite things that you've built using your skills? And like, some, especially transitioning from neuroscience mm -hmm. into coding, um, probably bringing some of that background with you. But even just a fun, flashy website, yeah. what are the things that you've created that you're like proud of, that you've mm -hmm. enjoyed? That have been fun. Sure, yeah, and I haven't managed to work my neuroscience skills <laughs> into this yet. I was imagining uh, some digital encyclopedia of awesome neuroscience. Oh, I'd love to do that. Tips. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, no. I haven't figured out how to do that yet. How to how to combine the two yet? But I'll think about it. Um, I think one thing that having technical skills and knowing how to program um, has really helped me do a lot of different things in all these different roles I've had in the tech world. Um, here at Codecademy, it helps me understand how hard programming languages are both to implement for our, our engineering team uh, and for how hard it is for people to learn them because mm -hmm. I've, I've learned enough of them to understand where the stumbling blocks are and what might be an appropriate choice for a beginner. Um, and it also allows me to fix things. Like We're a really small team. We're 12 people now. And so when there's a bug that's maybe non-critical but interfering with people's learning, I can pick it up and fix it in our code base and push a fix that our engineers can deploy. So it saves them some time, gets more done for our users, and is a hugely useful skill. I'd highly recommend learning how to program, especially if you're interested in the tech world. What about, um, tell us a little bit, you're behind, um, you founded Women Who Code, yeah. right? Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Um, so when I was living in San Francisco and I was making the switch over and learning as much programming as possible, um, I found that it's, it's somewhat challenging to be a woman in the tech community just because, especially in the technical community, because there are so few women there. And sometimes people would assume I was a recruiter at events or, or what have you. Um, and so I really just wanted a place for, to be where I could talk to other technical women, get to know them, and just talk about code. And so I, I put this meetup on the calendar. This is, I think, August 2010, I think. Uh, 2011, sorry, blanking on the date, uh, just over a year ago. And I was like, man, I hope 10 people show up and code with me because I'm going to feel really silly if no one shows up. And 100 people signed up for the first event. Wow. So I was blown away by the interest. Uh, basically, the organization hosts hack nights and tech talks for women who program. Um, they can be beginners or professional developers, but we come and sit in the same room and share what we're working on and help each other and get to know each other. And so seeing some of the connections that have come out of that have been really cool. People have gotten hired. They found mentors and mentees. They found friends. Um, I know I hired someone I met through that, so that's pretty cool. Um, and it's really taken off. Uh, there are chapters starting up in Denver, Arkansas, LA, uh, as well as maybe one in Canada coming soon to be a TBD. Uh, and there's a Silicon Valley branch as well, so it's nearby if you guys want to check it out. And we recently hit 2,000 women, which is pretty cool for uh, you know, sort of something that's spreading by word of mouth on Twitter and Meetup. And it, it's really providing a safe space for women who want to meet other women and, and know that they're out there. So. And what about inspiring young women who may not be um, in the professional world yet, but who um, aspire to, or you want to get them interested in coding yeah, and the tech world? It's really important because, again, uh, I think, to be honest, I think programming as a uh, profession as a, a field, as a passion, I think has a huge marketing problem. It's seen as something that's only for, uh, you know, really geeky white guys in a basement, like, typing away. Um, but it's so much more broad and interesting than that. And I think it's really important to get uh, young people interested, especially young women, just because for some reason it's we're not telling the right story to them at the moment. Uh, and there are a lot of organizations that are interested in doing that. Uh, women Who Code is focused on professional developers. Mm -hmm. But there are all sorts of camps. Uh, there's, there's one called Black Girls Code that runs workshops. Uh, there's uh, Girls Who Code out in New York. There, you know, there are a ton of ways to get involved. So if you're interested in teaching high school kids, uh, even just call up your local school and be like, hi, I'm a professional developer. Is there a computer science teacher who would be interested in like maybe me coming to speak one day or helping out with 
programming classes. There are tons of people who could use your expertise, so just get in touch. That's awesome. Well, speaking of this, do you have any role models yourself that have kept you sort of going in life, like people that you aspire to be like, or even mentors along the way that have helped you? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and so many people who have inspired me and helped me. Um, I think one of the first, I was thinking about this question the other day, and I was remembering my Halloween costume when I was eight years old. Um, I handmade my own costume of, uh, I was Athena, the, I was really into mythology, I went through this <laughs> mythology phase. And, um, I think everyone goes to that phase. Yeah, there's this <laughs> Dallaire's book with the colored pencil drawings. It's, yeah, okay, it's beautiful. Um, and I got really, I, I apparently identified with Athena enough to dress up uh, as her for Halloween. And she's the Greek goddess of knowledge, and she's a bit of a warrior. So that was, a, I think, a good role model for little Sasha um, back in the day. But since then, there have been so many professionals. Um, and science, you know, I wanted to be a scientist for a really long time. Um, and. Uh, people in tech who have built amazing things out of thin air. That's the thing I love most about this community and, and startups is that you take a computer and a command line and you build this amazing product that helps change people's lives. And so I'm just really excited to be part of this community and um, maybe some other people will follow me down this road. Yeah. That's great. What's something that you have on the horizon that you want to build? Maybe you don't have all of the skills yet to build it, or it's just the time or the energy? What's something that you've always wanted to do that? Oh, I have a long, so <laughs> <laughs> I have this list on my computer of uh, things I should program, um, and it's really long. Uh, <laughs> some of them are silly ones, like I've got, you know, some chatbots for, we have this like chat program that we use, and you can write little programs in it, and some of them are silly like that. Some of them are major features on our website, mm -hmm. um, and some are smaller tweaks, but knowing how to program changes the way you look at the world, so that when you when you know what you can do with the skill set, you start seeing things to build everywhere. It just It's like goggles, you put like Google Glass, you put on, <laughs> <laughs> and all of a sudden you can see all these things that you can change. So I have a very long list. That's awesome. We have another question from an audience member. Cool. Um, which is, what uh, do you have a favorite code editor? He <laughs> says he's also a beta tester for you guys. <laughs> cool. That's so awesome. He's a, he's a fan. Aw. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Um, I really like Sublime Text 2. It's really beautiful. It's a program that you can open and start using right away, so it's got a very low barrier to entry. Highly recommended. Um, I've also been learning Vim recently, which I stopped. This is very nerdy. Um, I stopped learning Vim just because the keyboard shortcuts, you have to use a lot of keyboard shortcuts to use it. Um, and I switched to the Dvorak keyboard when I was bored one summer in college, and I've never switched back. <laughs> um, so it's really not optimized for me. But I'm now I'm just sort of like, it lets you do so many things so much faster than I'm picking it up anyway. So it depends on how much time you want to spend learning your text editor. If you don't, Sublime Text 2. If you want to invest the time, Vim. Wait, so. You were talking about you switched over to the, you were just bored? <laughs> <laughs> in college, you've got time in the summers, and um, apparently I wanted to type faster. And so I switched to Dvorak, and here I am. Do you it's too lazy to switch back. Can you buy a laptop with a Dvorak? You could. I just touch type. Oh. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, very nerdy. Um, let's see, another question. By the way, you guys should send in questions, because uh, we're actively looking at the Dory. Um, I'm in high school in a data structures course that uses Java. What languages cool. should I learn after Java, and what are recommended future routes from John in New York? <laughs> That's a great question. And I think it really depends on what your goals are. Uh, if you want to learn the fundamentals of computer science, you know, Java is a great start. There are some others that are particularly interested in, uh, interesting. Uh, you could check out a functional language. I know Haskell is really trendy in the <laughs> hacker community right now. If you're interested in more going to web programming, there are all these interpreted languages that you can learn. So it, it really depends on what your goals are. Um, sorry, I can't give a more specific answer than that. Um, I actually would like to go back a little bit to the schools and talk about sure. what do you think are some of the things that teachers, educators, people can do to encourage more kids to mm -hmm. sort of take that first leap into programming? Because it's I know it's a global concern it is that we need more programmers and developers. Yep both from a professional level, but even just sort of that knowledge base and people understanding um, how code works, how their computer works, and demystifying technology yeah. in that sense. Yeah, I think uh, that's a great question, is like how do we get more people interested? Um, I think it's important to see the how powerful it is and what you can do with a little bit of knowledge, because that is 
there are only a small subset of people that like learning programming for its own sake and think it's inherently interesting. Um, for a, the vast majority of people, they're interested in what you can do with it. So showing people what they can do and showing people role models that look like them uh, are both really important. And related to that education question, um, there's so much happening in the space, in the ed tech space in general right now. How do you view Co Academy in that broader landscape? And um, have you made connections with other people who are, you know, uh, have that same mission to help educate students all over the world? Absolutely. Uh, there are a lot of people who are interested in this space right now, and there are a lot of people who are taking different approaches, a lot of new companies who are taking different approaches to get to the same goal. Um, there are some people who are more video based, there are some that are uh, starting up in person classes or this like hybrid model where you do some stuff in person, some stuff online, and then there's the approach we're taking with an interactive console. Um, so it's really interesting to see which methods will be most effective for which people. Um, so I'm really curious to see how the next few years go. Uh, in this space, because there's so much energy and excitement um, and venture funding there right now, so which is sort of a, a sign of where people's attention is. I think you hit on a really good point. Different people learn differently, mm -hmm. and so how do you address that at Code Academy in terms of le learning styles? Some people are more visual, other are more mm -hmm. oral. Yeah, I think the um, the research shows that the the learning style in terms of audio or visual actually doesn't make a huge difference because people all. Every person uses all of those styles at different points in different times. So I think it's really a question of matching the skill that you're learning to the method in which you're learning it. Mm -hmm. um, like, I wouldn't try to teach someone to juggle by video on the internet. Like, that's not going to work, or like cartwheel or dance or whatever. Like, that's really challenging because the medium doesn't fit the, thing or the topic. Um, but for programming, you actually learn by doing programming. You don't learn by reading. Like, if you think about it, you want to learn how to write programs, so you read a book. Like, that doesn't make sense. Um, but if you want to learn how to program, you should program. And this sort of gets you as close as I've seen to melding the two. Now, I think um, we have one more question here. Do you have any plans for PO, PH, PHP or Java courses? <laughs> but I think you already have them. We so, don't yet. Oh, you don't? But those are definitely some of the most requested languages. People really want to learn PHP. They really want to learn Java. So. Do you have a date coming out? I don't have a specific date, but we you are. You want to launch it, it right here, right now? <laughs> yeah, just a second. <laughs> Put that on your list of things to build. Yeah, it's it's on there. Trust me. <laughs> I'm sorry we don't have it yet. We will soon. That's awesome. Um, anything else that you would like to share with I the audience at sure. large? Yeah, I think um, there's a lot of a conversation about, and I'm saying this as a former teacher uh, because I see both sides of this argument. Um, there are a lot of people who say that because all of this content is shifting to the web, you can learn anything you want in these MOOCs and these video sites and on Codecademy and all that, that teachers as, an, as a profession are going to be replaced or become out of date or shift to being computerized in some way. And I think that's really fundamentally misunderstanding what teaching is. Uh, teachers are a lot more than content delivery robots. Uh, they also get to know you and push you when you're stuck and uh, reward you and, and coach you and help you and cheer for you when you're succeeding. And they are able to contextualize all those you know, generic resources that people have, the textbooks, the, the video sites, whatever. They're able to contextualize those and put them in a form that works for the individual learner. And that's something that computers are never really going to get that good at. Um, the content delivery part is actually a great help to teachers in that they no longer have to do that as part of their jobs. They're able to be freed up to spend more time one-on-one -on -one with students. Uh, which is really their strength. And um, I think that story, I, I, I would love to see teachers tell that story and that narrative about this change so that they can gracefully make that leap into the next stages. Because again, this technology isn't going away. It's, it's here to stay, and it's going to change and get better. Um, but teachers definitely have a place in this world, and uh, I think it's a really interesting one. Before we let you go, we have another question from the Dory. Um, from Jim in North Carolina. I'm currently making a career change after being a journalist for 10 years. As someone who made the transition smoothly, what kind of advice would you give? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, yeah, the transition was, it was super interesting. I'd love to know actually what he's transitioning to. Did he mention that? Does not say, Jim, okay. if you type in your <laughs> answer really quickly, Jim? maybe we can get to it. Sounds like a transition into at least something in the tech, tech. space. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, and I can tell you roughly what I did to make this transition um, a year before, because in teaching you have to give four months notice before you, when you change fields, which is a long lead time. 
Um, so a year before I made the switch, I started going to meetups around the, I have the advantage of being in the Bay Area, which has, you know, a different meetup every night on whatever you want. There's people here doing it. Um, and so I got to know people in the industry and uh, I learned more about the field to make sure I wasn't crazy and that I would have something to contribute. Um, and one really important thing that I did is I, I built things and I showed them to sh so that people knew that I was serious. Uh, I built programs and showed them. I worked for free for a startup for a while, building their product alongside the CTO. Um, I started Women Who Code. People were very impressed by that because it's it's taken off so quickly. I built things to show that I was serious. And there were things that were free and, and weren't like uh, years in the making, but they were showing that I was thinking about the field in the right way. Um, so ask lots of questions, listen hard, and build cool things. And uh, take it from there. Now, Sasha, there was one question on YouTube uh, that goes back to teaching. How can teachers who are in the classroom now leverage Code Academy with their students? That's also a great question. Um, I think one thing that the lessons really free teachers up to do is to, again, spend that one-on-one -on -one time with the kids who need it. So because the content and because a lot of the feedback is actually in the tool and teachers don't need to supply that themselves, they can spend a lot more time one-on-one -on -one with individual kids who might be struggling or kids who need, you know, finish our curriculum in five minutes and need more stuff to do, which has definitely happened. Um, so one model that, that a lot of teachers are exploring right now is the flipped classroom, where they do their reading um, and what they used to do in class is sort of like knowledge absorption step mm -hmm. of like read the thing, get it into your brain. They do that at home. And when they come in, they work on homework, they work on problems, they write little programs. And that's when the teacher's input is actually most useful. So having this content on the internet whenever, available from wherever you want, is great because they can do it at home and then you can use the classroom time more effectively. So that's, that's one thing we've been hearing a lot of good things about and we'd love to hear more about how it's working. Awesome, last quick question. Sure. Uh, besides starting amazing organizations and working at a world-class uh, institution, what do you do for fun? What do you do outside <laughs> of work? <laughs> what do I do for fun? <laughs> um, <laughs> that's a funny question. I, uh, that's a, I, I've been very focused on Code Academy recently, but um, <laughs> I'm pretty athletic. We're actually a really athletic office, by far the most athletic tech company I've ever seen. Um, we all like go for runs sometimes together and, the, and go to the gym. Um, when I lived in San Francisco, I did a lot of cycling. That's a little bit harder to do in New York because the roads are a little um, more interesting. Um, <laughs> but I really like sports. Uh, I like, uh, I love science. I miss it a lot. Um, I like writing and uh, love cooking. Don't get to do it a lot anymore. It's really hard to do in New York. Um, and I actually like knitting and I see a lot of parallels between knitting and programming. Um, so I can make pretty much anything you want. <laughs> it's a really <laughs> esoteric skill. Helps keep my hands busy. Um, and I have lots of scarves now. Yeah, I actually started knitting in college. On, I ran track in college, and I used to knit on the bus because there was nothing else I could do. Yeah. Um, and it was hours and yeah. hours and hours of it. Yep, good use for it. That's so awesome. That's cool. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate you taking the time. Um, this has been a really fun series. I think globally we've realized how many amazing, impressive women there are out there, and maybe there isn't a chance for them to get exposed as often as they should be. And yeah. you're doing a great job bringing that to light with Women Who Code. Um, so thank you so much. Cool. Thanks for having me. Thank this is you. a really cool series, and I can't wait to see what else, uh, what other great people you have on here. Awesome. Thank you for having me. Thanks for being here. Viewers, thank you for joining us. We have another session tomorrow with uh, Kim Pelosi, and it will be here at 2.30. So please come back and join us again. Thank you.